One of those things that has been sitting on my mind for years now, and it's a personal topic for me, really. Like, I know it sounds crazy, but it's shopping malls. Okay. It's not a secret they're dying. Yeah. If you go there, you're going to see half of the store, stores are closed down. There's a good chance it's not going to be around in the next couple of years. I think it's perceived to be just the way of the world. Some things outgrow their purpose and utility, and they disappear. Back in the day, you had a telephone in your house, mm -hmm. and now you don't. Everybody's got a cell phone. Back in the 90s, we had malls, and now everybody's got Amazon Prime. I think the death of the mall is an existential crisis for suburban America. And I think no one's really talking about it. And I think people are not realizing the second order effects or the consequences of that. So when I started this channel, I named it Disruption Theory because I wanted to explore and talk about the disruptive effects of technology. And so far, all my content has been super high tech, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering. And this one might seem like it's a little bit off brand because malls are not a high end technology, but it is a direct consequence of the disruption caused by technologies like e-commerce and Amazon in particular. Yeah. So 10 years ago, shopping online was not nearly as popular as it is today, obviously, right? And we perceive that to be a good thing. You go on Amazon, you click a bunch of buttons and things show up at your doorstep the next day, sometimes that same day. By a lot of people, that's progress. I mean, that is advancing as a society. Like who wouldn't want to live in a country or a society where you could do that? That's awesome, right? To that, I say not so fast. And the only reason I say that is because there is consequences to that. The second order effect of Amazon existing is that it knocks out retailers out of business. On the surface level, that's fine. Like, who cares? It's just a mall. But in urban design or city design, there's this framework and it's known as the third place. So the first place is your place of residence. It's where you live. The second place is where you work, your office. The third place is the local coffee shop you hang out on weekends. It's that mall you go to on a first date if you're a teenager. Yep. The movie theater where you go to socialize with your friends. Simply put, third place is where community happens, right? Community, yeah. The problem, though, is that third places are endangered species. They're under threat existentially. And the main third place that we've had in suburban America is the mall. It's no coincidence if you go back and you watch all these 90s movies, the main setting in so many horror movies and teenage movies, like you can't watch one without seeing them go to the mall at some point or reference the mall, right? Yeah. And why that is, like if you want to go back even further in that, like historically, if you go to Europe, Europe is an extremely old civilization, right? It goes back thousands of years. All the cities were built before the invention of the automobile. There was no cars when European cities were built, right? So all the cities are human centric. Everything is walking distance. The parks are integrated on the way to work. Everything is like made for humans. Fast forward to the 20th century, Henry Ford comes out, the car gets invented. And then American cities start getting built around the car, not the human. The automobile shrank the world. You can go to places in record breaking times and you can transport goods. Society was booming, commerce, everything, right? So what people started figuring out is like, you don't need to live near the place where you work anymore. You could live way off and you could work way over there. Get in your car and just go. So that's how suburban America happened. We have these communities where it's just housing. It's almost like a dormitory. You go there to sleep, eat, and then you go to work over there. Mm -hmm. Look at all the major US cities, right? New York, Manhattan, you live in New Jersey and you commute to New York. DC, you're in Nova, you go on 66 to DC for work. You hang out at the city, you go to the city, you go yep. downtown. Well, because there's nothing to do in suburban areas, right? That's by design, that's not yeah. a coincidence. That's a, a second order effect of the automobile. The automobile came up, disrupted society and gave us suburbia. Amazon Prime came out and disrupted the third places of suburbia. In 2008, the recession hit, Amazon took off more than ever. People stopped going out more than ever. And I think that was a time when we saw the, the beginning of the end of the mall. The way a mall works is you have a bunch of stores, but they're not evenly distributed. Some are like the flagship stores, the Macy's, the JC mm -hmm. they're the giants, right? And then you have a bunch of small moms and pop shops, a bunch of small stalls. The problem is that the flagship stores are the ones that generate the big rent and revenue, and they uphold the mall financially. So when they go out of business, 
they kind of bring every other story with them down, more or less, right? It becomes extremely hard for a mall to survive when the two flagship stores are well, They probably down. create foot traffic as well for all the other little ones too, right? Exactly. Not only are malls going out of business, but obviously they affect the entire community. But there is a, a sub-demographic, I think, is affected more severely than any of them. Teenagers. And if you want to go a step further, lower class teenagers. When I was in the U.S., when I came here, we were scraping at the lower end of the middle class. Lived in a small house. All my friends had small houses. You couldn't just go to your friend's house and hang out. Mm. But when you're 14, 15, where are you supposed to go hang out? You used to go to the mall. I used to go to Borders. Guess what? Amazon took Borders out of business. We used to go to Blockbuster. Netflix took Blockbuster out of business. So we're literally in, in a society where the small spaces where we can hang out and, and interact with each other, they're getting taken out. They're going out of existence. And by the way, one of the characteristics of third places, they have a few characteristics as academically described. One of those is they should be easily accessible to everybody. Public transport should have access to them. They should be free or low cost. So it's affordable by everybody. And it's something she's described as like the home away from home. All of those places for us were the malls and the movie theaters. And now malls and movie theaters are both under attack. HBO Go just launched, and they have the same movie as in theaters. Yeah. You can watch it at home. You don't have to go anymore. So to me, this is extremely, extremely concerning because as a parent, I wake up on a Saturday and I'm like, where do I take my son? Back in the day, there was a big ass Toys R Us. Mm -hmm. You remember that? The huge, the huge stores shut down. Well, especially in areas that have bad weather too. Like, what do you, you know, certain places you go, you can go to the park, you know. Yeah. But out here in the winter or in the summer, when it's scorching hot, you want to be indoors probably too. That's one of the biggest advantages of malls, and I think in general they get a bad reputation. But the way malls were actually originally conceptualized, they're fucking awesome. Malls were this extraordinary visionary place that was invented by Victor Gruen, which is this immigrant who came to the US in the 1950s from Vienna. And like I said, in Europe, you have the city square. You have this communal space in every city. There's a downtown, there's a town square. You have fountains, you have places that are inaccessible to cars, right? It's just for humans to go hang out, have a good time. In the US, we don't really have that. So Victor Gruen really missed that European vibe. His idea was like, well, I wanna bring the European town square to America. I'm gonna make it indoor so it's climate controlled. And believe it or not, malls were fucking awesome back in the day. They're nothing like what they are today. Back in the day, they had zoos, live animals. They had amusement parks. They had live performances. They had all these fun activities. Matter of fact, they had concerts inside of the malls. Very few people know this, but Britney Spears, she was broken out at a mall tour. The way you break out as an artist is you started doing tours across malls across America. Wow. And that's how you win an audience. I think, I want to say it was Sephora or Paul Mitchell. I think it was like a female beauty store or something. They had this tour and Britney Spears was doing shows and malls. And you'd see crowds. You can go on YouTube and Google like 90s mall performances. Bro, malls were lit back in the day. There's footage of them. It was a fun place to go. Yeah. I mean, I used to work in one. I remember even like yeah. in 2005, you know, now they're just dead pretty much. Somewhere along the way, the idea of a mall went from this fun city center experience to a capitalistic, you go there to buy shit experience. So much so that Victor Gruen actually regretted inventing the mall in his later years. Well, now it's looked at probably like everyone's loitering almost. If you're not buying, not shopping, then kind of get out maybe too. Not sure. Think about that. Yeah. Why are people loitering? They're just hanging out. But that's what kind of what he wanted to do, right? Yeah, like that was the whole point. So yeah. you loiter. Malls are made so you loiter in there and you hang yeah. out. And now the legal criminalized version of hanging out is loitering. Yeah. Nah, that's what they were meant to do. People to go hang out and, and not spend a lot of money. And now you go there, everything is optimized for you to buy food or, or clothes. And if you're not doing either of those, the security guards are doing a little round around with little segues telling you to get the fuck out. Yeah. This version of the mall that we got in the, you know, the later half of history, um, as bad as it is, it still serves as a central socialization place for underprivileged teenagers, especially, right? And 
Who's looking out for them? You go to the park, the park closes at eight o'clock at sunset, right? Well, where, where are you supposed to go, right? Where are you supposed to go? The other reason I started this channel and one of the points on which I pride myself in is I don't wanna just talk about problems and finger point and say, this is bad. I pride myself and always have with coming up with a solution or at least attempting to solve these problems. So I've been thinking about this a lot. It's like a close issue to me, I feel like, because I grew up in the US in my teenage years and I felt it. Malls are already a fantastic starting point. The foundation is already there. Everything I talked about earlier, they're easily accessible, there's public transport, there's utilities, they're indoor, they have climate control, they have electricity, they have running water, they have you know vast amount of space, and most people don't even realize how big a mall is. Because when you walk inside of a mall and you look at the storefronts here to here, you don't realize that there's actually a store that goes all the way back in both directions. Mm -hmm. They're fucking massive. People don't really realize that. On top of that, there's parking lots that are equally as big. So the question then becomes, how can we repurpose malls? Obviously, I think the cement has cemented. We can't redesign suburbia. It's too late. Now we have to do the best with what we have. One of the solutions I think we could do is we could turn the malls into a sort of an indoor park. Get rid of all the stores. Install swimming pools, ponds, greenery, trees. Another perk of malls is that they have this see-through ceilings, most of them, right? They let natural sunlight in. Knock down some of the store walls and just turn them into these fields, right? Plant interesting flowers, botanical gardens. Have a co-working space on one end. Have a kindergarten. You can have a bigger and better food court. You can have a reading section. The next question, I guess, would be who would pay for this? And here we also have a couple of options. One of the ways is the cities and counties subsidize the malls. Just like your city pays for your local library that you've never been to, mm -hmm. right? They could fund the mall. So the mall could be this government funded space. Think of it as a park. It could go under parks and recreations and they can take care of it, right? The other side of the spectrum is you can go private. You can turn the Amazon as a service where it's a subscription-based service. It costs $20 per month, just like a gym. And people have a subscription to the mall and you go in there and it's this fucking amazing, awesome park that's well-maintained. It's safe. It's open 24-7. There's, uh, you know, small businesses. You can be, you know, food restaurants. Uh, pools, gyms, co-working spaces, indoor bicycle riding, paintball. I mean, dude, how mm. sick would it be to have a paintball field, yeah. ice skating rinks, basketball courts, and the whole thing is private. So you get a family pass. You could pass. do both. You could do some private, some public. Yeah, or you could do both where the county subsidizes the main space and all the, the businesses still can you know function as independent entities and pay property tax or whatever to keep the lights on. There's a bunch of different plays, but... Either one of those options, I think, I'm not sure where we're gonna settle on the spectrum of malls should be subsidized by the government or entirely privatized and cost money to get in like LA Fitness or something. I'm not sure, but I think the bottom line is we have this precious resource that could be repurposed into something even better, right? My worst fear is they're gonna knock down the mall next to your house and they're gonna build townhomes and condos. Yeah. And they're not gonna replace that social space with anything. The question then becomes, okay, well, you have a social space which you replace with a residential space. Well, what are those people who live there, where are they supposed to go on a Saturday? And the county, the officials, they're doing nothing to cater to the psychological well-beings of their residents, which is, we're not robots that can just stay at home, especially in the pandemic. Winter is, is what, six months out of there and the other half is super hot, you can't even yeah. be outside. You're not taking care of this, the psychological well-being of your residents by letting developers come in and build buildings on top. You could take the mall as a, a liability, something that's just like not generating revenue, and you could flip it, repurpose it into a money-generating attraction where people from local counties want to go because your, your mall's so lit. Yeah. And repurposing is an interesting concept. An interesting example of what I'm saying that's been probably the most successful example that I can personally think of is the High Line in New York. On the west side of Manhattan, there was a railroad track that cuts directly in through the city. Obviously, the, it's an industrialization leftover that is no longer needed. So a pair of architects or city planners basically decided, well, how do we flip this, right? Is this 
monstrosity that's taking up space in the city. And they basically repurposed it into this awesome park, which is one of the biggest sightseeing attractions uh, in Manhattan, I believe. Is this mile long park where you're literally walking above the buildings. I've been there a couple times. Pretty cool. They have street performers. They have a bunch of things. And at the very end of it, I think, is the Whitney Museum. And it's a dope photography spot. You always see people in there taking, you know, snapping pictures. They have a little staircase. We can have a, a picnic. And they repurposed it. They took these old ass railroad tracks and they flipped it into this incredible world renowned park that otherwise nobody would really care for, right? Yeah. So that's the most successful repurposing project that I've seen. And I'm a fan of that because the boat already sailed on building new new things. I think in this climate, real estate property is so expensive right now. Oh, yeah. I don't see them building, oh, let's just experiment with an amusement. Nah, dude, build a bunch of condos, let them off, and then collect your bag. Yeah. Why don't we just leverage what we already have? And like I said, my biggest fear is that pretty soon you're going to wake up on a Saturday morning and the amount of place you can even go and take your kid or just hang out is going to be so limited and everything's going to cost money. You either got to go to a coffee shop, which by the way, they're becoming super overcrowded, right? I don't know if you've noticed that, but I think the work remote culture, every time oh. I go to co coffee shops, man, they're swamped now with people on, on calls and it changed the whole vibe, right? It used to be students studying quietly and now it's people taking meetings and you know babbling with their true. headsets. I think if you want to stay competitive as a city, it's a different day and age now. You have to adapt with the times. People are working remotely from home. A lot of people hate it if they don't have the space, if they're not used to it. People need co-working places, I think, more than ever. There's an empty mall sitting right there that is about to go out of business, man. Like Maybe we should put two and two together. And then while people are remote working, let them go take their kids to kindergarten where the old Sears used to be, right? And then maybe have a basketball court and a sauna and a gym they can go into the lunch break. And at some point, you can have this whole self-contained city that is climate controlled that you want to go to all the time because you're not going to sweat your ass off or freeze your ass off. You can take your kids. Your kids can have a full day. And so can you. You can go to work. You can go to the gym. You can go eat at a restaurant. You can go ice skating. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you know if there's like a, a city or a mall that's have, that has that in, at their, in their plans at all? Like, not that I no. know of be interesting to see but I almost wanted to start like a website like a movement like contact your officials and like harass them to not knock down the malls yeah because dude once it's gone it's gone like we're not going to get the social space back once they take it it's gone well I don't think you're putting light on the social space because I feel like everyone no one's looked at a mall that way it's just literally shopping for the most part yeah. you know and I feel like that's what people are going to be like oh shit we had somewhere to hang out you know, on the weekends or in the winter, whatever. I think the reason why this is such an invisible threat to people or invisible issue, so to speak, is because it doesn't affect them directly. Because you're not a teenager. You have a car. You have a house. You have your own setup at home. If you want to hang out with your friends, you can go to their house. They can go to your house. But, you know, if you're a kid that's, like, trying to figure life out, you're still developing, you're still trying to, like, I don't know, man. Not just, even just a kid, if you're the parent, too. Yeah. You know, once your kid turns into a teenager and stuff, you know, it's like, that's going to be more of a burden on you, too, trying yeah. to figure out what they can do on the weekends before you could just drop them off at the mall, pick them up later. And I just don't see how it's healthy to have a city or a community with less social spaces. That's why I love Europe so much, because it's predicated on social spaces first. Coming here, man, it's a nightmare. People complain, my kids are indoor all day, they're playing video games. Well, look, look outside. There's nothing but subways, Chipotles, and, and FedExes. Yeah. There's nothing for your kids to do. It's interesting because a park in America is completely different than a park in Europe. In Europe, parks are these integrated green spaces with benches that might have like a ping pong table like I've seen in Barcelona, that might have you know little classes, people roller skating. In America, a park is a sports facility outside with a barbecue area and a picnic area, but it's like way out of the way where you have to drive there specifically for that park, where in Europe, on the way to work, you pass three or four parks. It's a different concept. I know it's the same word, right? Yeah. But it's actually radically different. And why would a kid want to go hang out at a park? 
Dude, it's July. It's 110 well, degrees that, with global yeah, warming. Out here, too, exactly. Because I I wonder now if, like, Minneapolis, the I think it's a great mall of America, right? Because yeah. I think, like, pro- at least probably six months out of the year, they, they have a, a ton of snow. You know, and I feel like, like you said, global warming, too. You know, yeah. like, a park? Yeah. What are you going to do with a park in December? I mean, pe- people talk about global warming, and they want to address it. But then they don't want to look at the consequences. Well, the consequences, some areas are going to be uninhabitable for a majority of the year. Crazy hot summers, nasty ass winters. Where are you going to go, right? If you want to just leave your house, you have to go to a business. Think how crazy that is, man. You're literally forced to go to a business in January and in July. Where else would you go? A coffee shop, a restaurant? Where do we all kick it? At restaurants, yeah, bars, right? Well, now with COVID, you can eat, you know, they have the restaurants like in Old Town where you can eat on the street and stuff like that. But they're going to start, I think the county's going to start taxing the restaurants because you're eating up real estate, using up the street and the sidewalks and stuff. But in the summer, again, you're not going to want to hang out eating when it's 100% humidity and 90 degrees outside. Yeah, man, I think think this is an argument for... um maybe younger people to go in government. I know it sounds maybe crazy, but we need like fresh ideas. We need fresh perspectives on things. I think these mayors and people running these counties, they tend to be more on the older side. They're kind of stuck in their ways. And the the amount of change that's happening, they simply haven't experienced that amount of change in their entire life probably. Everything is terraforming. Things are different. We have smartphones, VR headsets about to take off. Society's gonna change. We have COVID, we have global warming. It's a lot of moving variables, man. And we have to be proactive about these things. And that's why I'm so concerned. Like, I don't want to wait until it's too late. And then the last precious resource we have is about to get pulled from underneath us. And we're going to be left with nothing but townhouses everywhere. And then you're going to be forced to, whether you want to or not, to drive 45 minutes to your local city, the nearest big city, be stuck in traffic. And that's your weekend. You got two days out the week, right? So... Anyways, man, I don't know. I hope uh, I hope somebody listens to this and gets inspired to do something. I'm not even sure what the right approach or the right way to make sure this idea takes off, but at least it's something for people to think about, man. But it, I find it extremely concerning because suburbia is already not a desirable place to live. I think a lot of the reasons people choose to live in suburbia is like family life. You have more space, mm-hmm. clean air. You can raise kids, right? There's kids out there in rural communities yeah. where... They hang out in Walmart parking lots. That is their third place. I'm sure you've heard about yeah. this. That is sad, man. That's how sad it is. You have to go to a business and hang out in their parking lot because your county, your government has failed you to provide you adequate spacing. They're not hanging out. They're loitering. Yeah, they're loitering. Yeah. Well, in the ultimate twist of irony, Amazon is buying back malls. Do you know about this? No. So in Ohio, Amazon, I think, already purchased a few malls. And guess what Amazon's doing with them? They're turning them into warehouses. And think about what I said earlier. All the malls are located near major highways, right? They're publicly accessible. They're dead smack in the middle of suburbia. So if you wanted to deliver goods in suburbia at even faster times, what better place to store your goods than a mall? So not only are malls endangered as is because they're going out of business, but you have this company ready to snatch them up to perpetuate the very business model that put them out of business in the first place. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised if there was an Amazon Prime logo at your local mall and you try to go in and you find out it's a warehouse that stores cheap They should sponsor the mall. They should be the ones that maybe pay for it. You know, we understand the the negative effect this is causing. So here's somewhere for everyone to hang out, you know? I like that idea. Or other sellers, whoever, if you sell stuff on Amazon, you should be able to sell your stuff there. Because me, I, I can't shop online. I want a physical store to go in and buy stuff, you know? So as long as I have somewhere to go and see the shirt and try it on, that's Mm -hmm. cool. So you've got the Amazon store there where you shop and buy, not just directly from Amazon maybe, but from other sellers that sell for Amazon. I don't know how it all works, you know? But then you also have the restaurants and everything too. So I think that's really interesting if Amazon takes over the mall. And by the way, they did something similar with bookstores. In another turn of irony, Amazon has bookstores and I love the experience. It's really dope. You go in there and mm-hmm. they have these little digital labels where they show you the actual reviews from users the way you would see it on their website. You would see it on, under a specific book or a section. Five stars. I love this mm-hmm. book. Is it a novel, right? They're buying up Whole Foods. They have grocery stores. Yeah. Why not open a mall? 
One of the benefits of having a mall as a shopping space is exactly what you just said. There are certain things where I want to go and I want to try out. Clothing is a good example. So I think in Japan, I think my man Randy was telling me this way back in the day, Japan had a very similar model where a store is simply a warehouse with a demo unit. So you go in there, you try out the washing machine, pull out your phone, scan it, you just bought it. It'll be in your house in two days. Mm. You don't actually pick it up at the spot. Don't worry about it, right? So it's just a showroom essentially for products. Dyson, you know, the vacuum company, yeah. They have a really interesting concept in their stores. If you have actually go to one of their stores, I don't know if you've you yeah, been to one. To, yeah, in Tyson's. Yeah. They have these little jars with dust you can pour on the floor and then vacuum. And it's almost like a little, you know, cool experience. But by far the most interesting shopping experience I've ever seen is in New York and it's called Showfields. It is this one of a kind store. Never seen anything like it. You go in there and it's almost like you're part of a play like a theater play. Mm. You have a character greeting, you dress like a princess and, and she's saying, quick, the, the army of the Red Baron is chasing me. Help me hide somewhere and come, to, you know, come check out this awesome vacuum or something. And she's in character. She's not really selling you. And you walk into a room and the whole room is actually like a decorated, crazy, trippy set. And you can try out the products. And then, then somebody else comes in and saying, quick, you go up there and it's a completely different experience. And then they have a slide where you actually go down a slide mm -hmm. from one store to the other. And the whole thing feels like a play. But if you're ever in New York, Showfields is Showfields. the most interesting store you ever go to. Cool. I feel like certain stores take up too much real estate, too much square footage. It's <clears> literally <throat> a warehouse. Let's just say you're browsing on your phone and I want to go see this polo. Well, this is aisle three, section 14. And you just go and you right. see, okay, bet. I want it, you know? That'll be dope, but I still don't like the concept of having precious social space being taken up by merchandise. Yeah. You should have the warehouse way out there where people don't live. And then I, I want to wait a day longer than get it the same day at the expense of having my mall taken mm. away from me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the other key point to malls, we talked about the historical context of the mall, but we also have to look at where society is headed. So let's look at the futuristic trends of what's about to come down the line, right? One of the biggest one is autonomous cars. Autonomous cars are gonna be here in 15 years, the latest, right? All that parking lot space at the malls is gonna be obsolete. No one is gonna be parking at the mall. Your car is gonna drop you off and then probably go do something else. And uh, in the meantime, whenever you're done shopping, you can summon it, it will come back, pick you up and take you home, right? Transportation is gonna change in the next 15 years. All those parking lot spaces in the mall can be turned to tennis court fields, basketballs. Mm -hmm. You can do artificial lakes. You can do an artificial beach. I don't know, man. There's a lot of room to play with, right? Yeah. Another one, which is, I'm a bit skeptical on this, is uh, flying cars or these drones. You've seen these concepts. Uber invested in a company that's basically like a two-person drone. Those drones need to land somewhere. What better place than the rooftop of a mall? You can have mini mm -hmm. helipads that are housing drones on top of your mall, take off, and they go to New York. Yeah. They drop you off and they can land. So malls can essentially be the future airports of drone travel. I was in Paris once meeting a friend of mine and we had a conversation about architecture and he said some dope shit to me that changed the way I think of architecture. He said, our job is to design buildings that accommodate for the ideas that you guys come up with. And I was like, yo, that's, that's profound because that changed the way I think about things, right? The job of a building or a mall in this case is to morph to our needs, not the other way around. Mm. If we have flying cars, well, that needs to be an airport. If we have autonomous cars, well, then we don't need the parking lot. We can use it for basketball or something. Yeah. So that's the other aspect I think that gets really interesting. When you look at all these futuristic trends that are coming down our pipeline, how can we leverage the mall to make our community better? Think of the house value. If you have a drone airport within 10 miles or 10 yeah. minutes of your house, right? The, the house value is going to go up. I remember reading 50 Cent's book by Robert Greene, The 50th Law, and there was a chapter in there that I love. The title said, turning shit into sugar. Always stuck with me. Take a negative, flip it to a positive. You have a dying mall, that is a negative. The positive is how can you take this dying building and turn it to an attraction where people are coming to spend money from all over the counties that is gonna raise the home value of the whole city and is gonna be a net positive to your community at the same time. And we need that type of thinking when you're pressed on resources and you can't build things that you would desire. You got to get creative. You got to get imaginative. And I think the mall is a canvas for us to play with 
But we got to save that canvas before developers come in and build content. Well, that's that's the thing. You have to be able to come up with what's next other than the obvious, which is real estate. You know, everyone's right. just thinking, oh, it's going to close. They're going to mow it over and just put condos or townhouses in there. But like, what else can, why aren't we exploring all these other options too? You know, it's like yeah. you know, people are limited. I think of the county, let's developers take over a mall and build buildings. That is short-sighted. You're going to cash in on the, on the short term. Yeah, we're going to get more revenue and property taxes, right? But at what cost? At the psychological cost of these people. And it's going to be a community where it's not even desirable to live anymore. And then the, the, the minute somebody out there, someplace, pulls this concept off that I'm talking about and turns the mall into the hottest social space where you want to go out. Ohio. I, I think that's going to be the winning formula. It's going to be imitated. And one of the things, I took a class on city building once online. And one of the quotes that always stuck with me was, uh, you measure the success of a city by how long it can hold its residents outside. When you go out, you don't want to go home, right? You go there, you're there for six hours at a time. Mm. That's the hallmark of a good city. That's the hallmark of a good city space. You don't want to go home because you're having so much fun. And even nightclubs, man, think about it. One of the big problems with nightclubs in suburban environments is it's too damn loud. Residents are always complaining. Mm. Dude, malls are in the middle of these huge parking lots, usually, right? They're not near any buildings. And dude, malls are so big. You can have it in the, the most deserted part of the mall. You can have a nightclub. You know how much revenue you can generate? It is safe. It is in a contained space. Yeah. You can have police presence. You can have security, right? There's no cars flying by. And I mean, dude, there's so much possibilities with malls, man. I don't know. I don't know if it's just me. I know it sounds weird that I've been going off about malls for so long. But bro, like I spent a lot of time thinking about this because yeah. I see a lot of potential and I'm, I'm afraid it's going to get taken from us. Yeah. Like the developers are going to come after you now. You're like, shit, someone's on to us, you know? They probably thought about it, you know? They're like, fuck. <laughs> I don't know. I think they just see dollar signs. Yeah. I think they just see dollar signs, but they I think... They become like landmarks. Like you go and, you know, look at the Grand Canyon. You're going to go come to Tyson's, you know? You know, that's how the Mall of America was. It was a landmark. People used to do cross-country trips. Just to go there. Just to go, stop yeah. by and check it out. It was like a spectacle. But keep in mind, that's in the age where malls were closer to the original vision of what they were supposed to be. Mm. These spectacles. You might see a line in there. You might see a circus act. You might see a concert. You might go on a roller coaster. You know? Yeah. And now, man, like all that is gone. And another one that I spent a lot of time on is Blockbuster. Because Blockbuster, at surface level, is a store where you go to rent a movie and you leave. So what, it went out of business. So what, Netflix is 10 times better. I could sit at home, I could hit play, watch infinite amount of movies for the cost of one DVD per month, right? That is true, like there's, you can't argue with that. But you're also neglecting a lot of second order effects. Here's some interesting ones that I've noticed. Have you noticed that when you go to Blockbuster, first of all, it is a spatial experience. You walk down aisles, you might stumble onto something on the floor, you might pick it up and find your next favorite TV show. That is eliminated at home because Netflix is run recommended. Run into your friend. You might run there. into your friend. Your teacher. Hopefully not. You might catch her in the, in the wrong section. But yeah, like that is eliminated. All the serendipitous experiences running into a friend, randomly discovering a show on a fallen DVD, those are no longer on the table because Netflix is giving you what it thinks you want to see. It's controlling your faith in a way, right? Like you're not going to randomly stumble onto something if their algorithm does not want you to. Yeah. That's something that's lost. I'm not saying it's worth keeping Blockbuster around just for that, but we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater sometimes. You got to analyze like what are the second order effects of these things? Right? There's another interesting thing that I observed over the years. If you go to Blockbuster and you rent the hottest movie and you manage to get the DVD before it gets rented out, the chances that you're going to watch that movie in its entirety are about 90%. You're not going to watch two minutes in and say, nah, I'm bored. Bro, you just paid $12. You're watching the damn movie. Netflix now, with Netflix, mm. that's not the case. The value of a movie is just not there to say, it's like, okay, this is, nah, boring, next, next, next. It devalues the whole emotional investment. So Blockbuster going out of business isn't so much as a community losing a movie store. Blockbuster going out of business fundamentally changes your emotional relationship to movies. Right? It's like diluted almost. Yeah. They become disposable. 
Yeah. A movie is not something you own anymore. Like somebody told me, you probably have more books than m most people I've seen, even though this is not a lot of books. And I was like, you really think so? It's what? What would you say? Maybe 100 books here? Yeah. Um, back in the day, people had shelves like this with DVDs. Oh, yeah. They had collections that were curated. They weren't just some bullshit ass titles. Bro, how many DVDs do you have? I don't have a DVD player. Same. <laughs> Same. And more importantly, like, we don't even own our own media, right? That shift going from Blockbuster to Netflix, we didn't just lose a physical social space. It altered our relationship with media. We no longer own our media. Everything is subscription based. That cannot be overstated enough. That is a big deal. It is a really big deal. Because Kanye pioneered this new thing where you put an album on Spotify and two days later you're like, you know what, ah, the snares are too low. I want to I change the snares mm. out. And you update the track. Like, yo, hold on. I just listened to the song. There was a verse by somebody. And now that's, that verse is no longer, it's no longer there. Yeah. That you was not a it. thing, right? Yeah. Owning a CD means I own this. My favorite example of this is the Carter 3, which I used to sell bootleg in high school. There was a song on there, one of my favorite songs, Playing With Fire. It's a Rolling Stone sample that Wayne used. And the Rolling Stones sued him. I think they won. And they stopped putting that song out on CDs. So if you got the first 400,000, that song is on that CD. Afterwards, it is no longer there. You go to Spotify, that song is missing. So I'm talking mm. to somebody. You heard the Carter Three. Oh, yeah, I loved it, man. What would you think about Playing With Fire? What's that? Song number, whatever, seven. Nah, I, I never heard that. So now... Even our fundamental experience with, with media has changed. Dude, we might not even see Will Smith movies on Netflix in the next week if they cancel That's them, right? True. Yeah. So you're literally, your access to information is at the whim of these corporations. And, and they get to pull things and yep. say, nah, not anymore. And it's not that you can't get your hands on it, but we're lazy. And we're just like, ah, whatever. I just won't listen to that song anymore. Ah, I, I don't want to watch that movie anyways. We're missing out. And these second order effects are everywhere. And I guess that's one of the themes of this episode for people that have made it this far and are still listening. Second order effects are something that I'm utterly fascinated by because ever since I learned about that concept as a mental tool, I see the world differently. And I think if you take the time to, to understand what it is, you probably would too, you know what I mean? It's funny because that's true. Like just sneakingly just going in there and taking that song out. There's a song by Drake. I don't even know what it is, but I remember it because I remember the verse and I was like, damn, that's fucking dope. It was, he says, uh, I listened to Metallica for meditation. And then all of a sudden it says, I listened to heavy metal for meditation. Oh, really? Yeah. So Metallica is no longer there. It's Do you just, know what song this is? What I, album I this is? I don't. I don't. But I remember right, specifically it listening to it because I was like, damn, that's dope. Like Metallica. I remember I, I probably like put it on like a MySpace, I mean, not my MySpace, Facebook, like a quote or something like that. Just went away. And I was like, damn, that's crazy. You ever heard of the Mandela effect? Uh, I've heard, I don't know what it is, but I feel like I've heard of it. It's basically when you thought that something was one way in the past and then it turns out you go back and check and it was completely different and you're like brain fucked. You're like, wait, wait, which one is the, the truth? Oh, so you think I maybe... Not... No, no, no. That's a thing. People are like calling it Mandela effect. I think they're, they're, it's M.E., and like, oh man, that's so M.E. Mm. So if you look it up, there's people that kind of collect these sort of incidents and people that have the Mandela effect that are arguing, no, man, that Drake definitely said Metallica. No, he didn't. He said rock. This is probably contributing mm. to the Mandela effect. Us not owning our own media is probably feeding into it even more because now samples are getting pulled out. And there's no way to verify it either, I'm sure. You know, maybe there are, yeah. like you said, some originals, if someone did, if it was an actual album and you have them, you know, but yeah. Do they still sell CDs? Yeah, they still sell CDs. Okay. I'm actually thinking of going back and just buying CDs. I'm thinking about going back to my favorite movies and buying the Blu-rays. And this is one of the main drivers why. Like, I want to own something that I know is there, that I know that's not going to change. Uh, with Will Smith smacking Chris Rock, I that's would not true. be shocked if the Netflix movies featuring Will Smith get pulled. And I've seen that happen over and over again. Masterclass. I took a class with Dustin Hoffman. One of the most profound classes where I fundamentally understood the role of a director. He opened my eyes and enlightened me what it was to be a director. A month later, allegations. Some, he groped somebody. I'm not casting judgment. He did. He did not. I don't know. But they took the class down. I'm like, come on, man. Like, you can't. You guys can't keep pulling media underneath people like that. Yeah. And now, if you want that class, you have to go pirate it and, and torrent it somewhere. 
he so could find it. Yeah. We live in this like world, man, that like we don't even have control of the things. We kind of hand over control. And the crazy thing is, you've been subscribed to Netflix for 10 years. You've been paying, I don't know, 100 bucks a year. Yeah, you don't own a single movie. You have given them $1,000 in a decade and you have nothing to show for it. If yeah. they went out of business tomorrow, you have nothing to show. I mean, you have the convenience as a second, you know, that's the first order effect, but you don't own any of that media. You can't say, you know what, I feel like watching The Matrix in, in you know, 4K. So, like, yeah. Like yeah. Photoshop too. You use Photoshop or Lightroom or all that. You know, it's like you pay subscriptions. Like, wait, I just want to buy it. You can't. You can't just buy it. Yeah, yeah. You subscribe. And, and anyways, going back to Blockbuster, that's one of the second order effects that people don't really talk about. Some people don't even realize that those things, you missed out on things. You think you're gaining the convenience, but it's always at a cost. It's never free. Yeah. Do you remember going to Tower Records? No. Tower Records was like a circuit city or something. I don't know okay. what the closest analogy is. Music based or, you know, thousands of CDs, comic books. You can go in there in the listening stations and try out different music. And somebody will say, well, yeah, I can do that on my iPhone anywhere. But kind of the, the experience is that it's not anywhere. It's right there after school on a Friday because you can't do it anywhere else. So everybody else is forced to go there. So you're going to run into kids your own age and your friends and people from your school at Tower Records, six o'clock on a Friday, because they're all going there to check out that new, whatever, Snoop Dogg CD that came, whatever it is, right? Then when you start looking at the second order effects, you start realizing we're missing out on so much. So the next question is, well, how can we get the best of both worlds? Like one of the concepts that I had early on is in an age of abundance, if I was a, if I was a rapper, if I was doing music, I would have music drops at a specific location that you can access on your phone, but you have to be within that location. Mm. You have to be in that park. I'm gonna check the GPS, and only then can you have a listening link, right? And that's mm. not a new concept either. But things like that, man, like I'm into like, how do we incorporate the best of both worlds? It's all gonna come down to, I guess, the money. I feel like that all, you know, the bookstores, it's gonna get expensive to own real estate, you know, to sell books. I but. think you're right. I think it's going to come down to the money, but I think we're saving so much money. At Blockbuster, you might spend, I don't know, what, 10 bucks a DVD. You might look at 10 movies. That's 100 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. You're saving hundreds of dollars a year. You're not going to Tower Records. You're not buying CDs. You're saving all this money. But it's going to get to the point where you're saving so much money where you want to spend it on these dope social experiences, but you don't even no have way. a place yeah. to, to do it. And I think people are going to pay top dollar to bring back those social experiences. That's true. Yeah. On that note, man, let's run this back.